to Congress House uh, this morning. And thanks again to Unions 21 for organising today's event. Unions 21 over the years has made, I think, a really important contribution in creating, in, in creating a little bit of space for people to step back from some of the day-to-day -day issues and to think about some of the big strategic challenges that we face in the trade union movement. And thanks to Unions 21 too for the research that you've done on young people, unions and the cuts, which contains, I think, some really fascinating insights from the focus groups that were conducted with young workers. Uh, indeed, it was gratifying to see that when asked which word they associated with unions, only one person replied, bastards. So, <laughs> so we're clearly doing something, clearly doing something right. Um, and just to say it's a pleasure as well to be uh, here sharing the platform with, uh, with Ed. Ed has been a, a powerful, energetic opponent of the government and its cuts strategy. Uh, perhaps I think the best critique that I've heard of the coalition's programme was Ed's Bloomberg lecture last August. Uh, an intellectual tour de force that showed that there is an alternative deficit reduction strategy based on growth and jobs, an alternative that's not only fairer, but far more likely to be successful. But with our national demonstration against the government's current strategy just a week away, we have perhaps an important, hugely important opportunity to get this message across to the British people that there really is an alternative. And let's be frank, we still got work to do to convince uh, the public that there is a different way forward. Even though the government lacks a clear mandate to make massive cuts, and even though public opinion is beginning to move in our direction, an Ipsos Murray poll in The Economist this week showing a real shift of opinion against the government strategy, we can't be complacent and the battle for hearts and minds is far from won. One of the most striking findings of the Union's 21 research, and one of the most worrying too, is that a passive acceptance of the need for cuts on this scale seems to be prevalent amongst young people. So it's our job to show them that it doesn't have to be like this, that young people and indeed working people of all ages are not powerless to act, that there can be a better, fairer future for Britain if we have the courage to grab it. And that's what I want to focus on today. But before that, it's perhaps just worth reflecting just for a few moments on what we're up against. As we all know, the government is making £81 billion of cuts over the next four years, a colossal and reckless gamble that's likely to lead to economic sclerosis the degeneration of our public services and an even more unequal society. And the burden's going to fall on those least able to cope, among them young workers and students. Now the government likes to say that its deficit reduction plans are all about not passing the burden of debt onto the young people of tomorrow. But the problem is they're making the young people of today pay an enormous price. With one in five under 25s out of work, educational maintenance allowances axed and tuition fees tripled. We risk creating another 1980s style lost generation and the long term social costs could be huge. So now more than ever, we need to give our young people a sense of hope about their future prospects. And we in the trade union movement have to demonstrate that we are relevant to their concerns and aspirations, recognising that we haven't always been great at this in the past. But regardless of how old people are, whether they're young workers seeking to get their first job or older workers coming up to retirement, I think that we've really got to get two key ideas across. First, we have to show that there really is a genuine alternative to austerity. An alternative based not on savage ideological cuts, but on growth and jobs, keeping people in work, keeping
keeping tax revenues flowing. The lessons of economic history are clear. This is not just the best way to, re to repair the public finances over the long term. It's really the only way. As the experience of Ireland has shown, massive cuts are a false economy. They undermine growth, increase the benefit spend, and can make the deficit worse, not better. Contrast that with the experience of America, which has kept the spending on, and where growth, jobs, and tax revenues are now returning. And our argument is backed by expert opinion. Former MPC member Danny Blanchflower, Nobel Prize winners like Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, and by influential commentators like Martin Wolf and Sam Britton at the Financial Times. And as we make the case for growth and jobs, we also need to make the case for tax justice. Tapping into the growing anger out there about how the city, UK PLC and the super rich avoid paying their fair share of tax. Anger that is perhaps felt most keenly by young people. And where better to start than with a Robin Hood tax on financial transactions, which has the potential to raise tens of billions. And it was great news that the European Parliament voted in favour of a financial transactions tax just last week. So there is an alternative. It's credible and it's gaining momentum. But second and perhaps more fundamentally. We need to show how Britain can deliver prosperity for all in the long run. And I'll be frank, I think this is a huge challenge for us in the trade union movement, and it's also a huge challenge for the Labour Party. What the financial crash and subsequent Great Recession signaled was the end of the long neoliberal hegemony of the past three decades. Indeed, the crisis we now face is first and foremost a crisis of market failure. But here's the rub. Across Europe, what ought to be a progressive centre-left moment is so far proving to be anything but. In the continent's biggest countries, France, Germany, Italy and Britain, the centre-right is in power and calling the shots. And a big part of the problem is that we haven't really worked out a credible alternative, longer term vision of our economic future once we look beyond the issue of deficit reduction. Contrast this to what happened when the post-war Keynesian settlement began to unravel in the mid-1970s. The new right had its ideological platform of privatization, deregulation, and liberalization ready to roll. Whatever we may think of it, Thatcher and Reagan had a ready-made program for government when they came to office. So we on the centre-left have got to do some intellectual heavy lifting and flesh out the contours of a new kind of economy, fairer, greener, more stable. From climate change to the ageing society, from globalisation to mass migration, we need an economic narrative that stands up to the great challenges of our age. And there's much we need to get our heads around. How we reform the city and the banks, rebuild our manufacturing base, regenerate the regions. How we fund the Green New Deal that we need to prepare us for the new low carbon age. And how we deliver fairness for all raise the wages of ordinary workers and move to a much more even distribution of wealth. Over the last 30 years or so, the proportion of our national income of GDP that's gone into the wage packets of ordinary people has shrunk from 65% to 52%, while all the wealth has been sucked up into the profits uh, and the coffers of the wealthiest. Now, there are lots of good, important ideas uh, being talked about. From an active industrial strategy to a living wage, from green bonds to a high pay commission, from a new model of corporate governance to workplace democracy. But the challenge that we face is this. To weave all of these ideas together 
into a clear, compelling vision that's economically credible, politically attractive, and captures the imagination of ordinary people, in particular, the younger generation. And rather than using the dry, technocratic language, perhaps that's too often been used in the recent past, I think we need to rediscover the inspirational discourse of equality, justice, and fairness. That's the best way to connect with the people outside this room. Now, it all goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about getting our message across to the British public. Next Saturday represents an important milestone, and I believe, believe we really have a genuine chance to begin to change the terms of the political debate. But in the longer run, in the months and years ahead, it's through the quality of our arguments that we'll win people round to our cause. With the cuts starting to bite, with anger growing at the banks, with millions of workers facing an uncertain future, we have to rise to that challenge. And that there is a real opportunity to make progress for our values and our ideas. Let's make sure we take that opportunity. And thanks for listening this morning.